Um, hello. Uh, I don't think you were expecting me to be talking today. I'm just sort of. Uh, <laughs> I was allowed by by my auntie Dee Dee and by Anna Christie to be the sort of warm up act for my grandmother. <laughs> so I'm, I'm very grateful for this chance to talk about George Scott Moncrief, who um, he's. I actually only really knew him as my great grandfather until a couple of years ago, or last year really, um, when I actually really um, discovered who he was in uh, as a as a man of letters, as a Catholic convert, um, as someone who dedicated his whole life to to writing in Scotland for Scotland about Scotland, um, and for a huge part of his life was was very dedicated to the faith as well. Um, he was very involved with, sorry, this is his, this is him, and uh, this is his wife, uh, Anne Scotman Creef, who was an Arcadian, uh, and she was also a writer, um, uh, writer as well, who uh, both of them together were involved uh, in this movement called the Scottish Renaissance, so sort of 30s and 40s uh, movement of writers uh, who, spearheaded by the poets Hugh McDermott and Edwin Muir, who all started moving back up north to Scotland and becoming much more excited about Scotland and uh, kind of putting it back on the map as a cultural entity. Um, and quite a few of them were very favourable to Catholicism as well. And I think that's a very interesting side of those that movement of writers that is still worth exploring as well. Um, yeah, I... Sorry, can we do the next slide? Um, this is just a quote from an obituary of George Scott Moncrief by the Edinburgh priest, Father Jock Dalrymple. Um, so it says, in all his work, George Scott Moncrief was driven by his great love for his country and his devotion to the faith. These dominated his life, which was, which was shaped around them, and we rem remember him for his constancy and loyalty and his capacity to inspire those virtues in others. Um, and I just really feel that I've been inspired in both of those virtues through reading his work, and uh, not just me, but uh, my cousin who I was living with and, and my friends around me in the Edinburgh chaplaincy. Um, so that's why I'm, I am excited about it. Um, I came back from, two years ago, I came back from uh, spending a year in Vietnam where I was uh, living and working with the Vietnamese church there. And uh, I think that's a church that's very much you know, on fire for the gospel and, and growing. And um, uh, I came, came away much more inspired in my faith. Um, but it also it's a church that you could see is very much Vietnamese and, and the faith is very enculturated there. And so I came away as well with this desire for something which actually I don't maybe experienced a bit of, but I really wanted to, to experience fully in Scotland. Um, and, and sort of these questions of what does a Scottish Catholic um, church and Scottish Catholic traditions look like um, and, and wanting to be enriched by that. Uh, so, yeah, that's why it was exciting to discover that my great-grandfather had had these same questions um, and had written about it. Yeah. Um, so this is just another quote from, from an obituary to get you a bit more of a flavour for, for who he was. All his life he was mixed up in the politics, art, literature and religion in Scotland. And in all those areas he was a knowledgeable and respected figure. Someone early in his life dubbed him Skomo. And it was a Skomo that he was widely known and loved in his native land, a dishevelled, untidy, wind-blown figure with a cleft palate and a hair lip, rapid speech, a tumble of ideas, immense warmth and charm, and marvellous hospitality. <laughs> um, so, so it was moving, reading these biographies about, about his character that really made me feel like I got to know him as well. Um, so, yeah, George and Anne Scotman Creef, uh, for the large part of their lives, uh, they, they wrote articles, radio programmes that promoted Scottish culture. George became a self-taught expert in uh, Scottish architecture uh, and topography, geography. Uh, they wrote shor short stories, poetry, novels and plays, uh, all set in Scotland um, and in both Scots and in English. Um, but I think so. Oh, so, so even even before they converted, it's very evident that, um, that for them, that their passion for the country, what underlay it was, was a, a realisation that there's a, there's a deeper truth um, that, that was underlying this beauty and this goodness that they saw <coughs> in their native land. Um, and I think that that's something that pulled not just them, but other writers around them towards the Catholic Church. Uh, this is just a poem that he wrote 
and in the early 1930s when he was living up in Skye working in a croft. Um, and it's, it's about, uh, well, it's sort of, you can't really see the background, but I've got Brackadale and Skye in the background. Um, <laughs> but it, it's, uh, it's him being outside uh, in the, the kind of twilight, dusk time. Um, and if you just look at the, the last four lines, it's sort of an, an appreciation of the, <coughs> of, uh, his surroundings and, and uh, the last four lines. The first star sprang to being in the east. The wood smoke, pungent on the cooling air, reached me as incense to the silent priest upon, the, a, wind, upon a wind which hovered in my hair. Mm. And so you can see that, and, and this wasn't just for him, but for, for other writers at the time, that uh, these poets and artists, it was the, the seeing of God in, in the nature and in the beauty of Scotland that gave them a greater appreciation of sacramental religion. And, and of the Catholic faith. Um, uh, yeah. uh, one of my favourite uh, of his works is this small book of poetry called A Book of Uncommon Prayer, which is just a collection of, of 20 poems. Each one is said by a different Scottish wildlife animal, um, and, and each is a, is a prayer uh, to God. So they're, they're very childlike and, and innocent in, in that they, they capture that side of your imagination and your heart, but they're also very profound. Um, and you can see that he's exploring this. Uh, well, yeah, he was a, he was a uh, a novelist as well, and he's very interested in just man's relationship to God and and um, in all of the depth of human experience. And uh, that's explored in these poems. So I'm not going to stop and read them because uh, I don't want to take up too much time. Uh, I think I've got. Oh no, yeah, next one. Sorry. Uh, this is actually a quote taken from a book that he wrote um, quite a long time after his conversion. So through his conversion um, and just through events in his life, George Scott Moncrief became increasingly interested in, in holiness and, and in man's individual search for God. And, and in his books and in his writings, it's, it's very um, evident that he saw that in the Scottish landscape. Uh, and this is a quote taken from a chapter which is uh, written about the Scottish wilderness. I mean, two minutes ago it was hailing. And <laughs> I love Scotland, but sometimes I, I dread the prospect of the fact that I might have to live here for the rest of my life because it's <laughs> <laughs> most of the time <laughs> it's not it's not the most delightful place. With the it's bleak, you can't go that much in a lot of parts, and the weather's not great. Um, but what he saw in that is this, you know, that that so much sanctity has grown from people that have gone stepped into the wilderness and into places where you can't hide from yourself and you can't hide from God. Um, so this is just, it says, for the essence of the wilderness is its uncompromising actuality. Long, wild, bleak days, streaming rain, many discomforts. They soon lose their aura of romance and leave one beautifully, if terrifyingly, free. <laughs> um, so he wasn't just a romantic. He's actually aware that actually this is just good... Um, breeding ground for saints. <laughs> <laughs> um, so George and Anne both became Catholics in 1938. Uh, Anne converted first um, and uh, George followed her into the church within a few days. Uh, so and five years later in, in 1943 Anne died suddenly and tragically aged 29 leaving George alone with three small children. Um, and that was in the same year that two of his brothers died in combat. So this is a, a this time of immense shock for him, and an immense suffering. Um, was really a time where he, uh, for him to grow hugely in, in his faith. And uh, yeah, I, I think from the poetry that he wrote at the time, and, and from the focus of his, his writings thereafter, and from the reports of people that knew him, um, he really. Um, use this time to, 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 to kind of face the reality of, of, of what it is to, to be a Christian and what Christianity teaches. Um, so, the next, yeah. Oh, so, oh, I missed out that one. Oh, well, we'll go back to it. Um, can we do the next one? Sorry. Thanks, yeah. This is just one of the poems that he wrote at that time. Uh, so he says, our life here has no fullness till we know fullness of death, not in its bordered part, but piercing through the grave's mud wall to prove, beyond contention, knowledge of the heart. Now as one who's most loved is abroad, 
who feels he knows the nature of that land, which he traverses in the love of one whose thought went ever with his hand in hand. I am who ventured where he never was, aspiring thither to that company, yet more than patient am to fill these days with a new fullness of eternity. So really I just want to draw your attention to this fullness of life that he's, he's really discovered, um, that, that the fulfilment of, of all that's good uh, and beautiful and all of the great experiences in this life really come through death. And that's why um, it's not that we have to spurn, spurn the goodness and the beauty that we experience on earth, but we just have to, I suppose, be detached and, and realise what it's preparing us for and who it's preparing us for. Um, so just, I just, I really like those last two lines. I more than patient am to fill these days with the new fullness of eternity. And uh, um, people who wrote about, George wrote about his deep Christian optimism and that um, this experience of death and suffering and, and this realisation that actually heaven is what we're living for didn't make him sort of spurn the world, but made him actually really kind of newly dedicated to it and newly appreciating of it, that the world is um, a pleasant place when you realise that, that actually um, it's an indicator of, of what we've got to live for in the next, and that can give us a really deep, true joy. And uh, I'm sharing this partly because I just... his his explorations of this are, are, are just fascinating as a, as a Catholic writer. Um, and one of his, his greatest works, I think, is a, is a novel that he wrote set in Edinburgh, which explores, it's kind of a semi-autobiographical novel, which is about a man who, who comes to the faith through the life and the death of the woman that he loves. And you can see the title, Death's Bright Shadow, that, that his, his um, deep Catholic theology is there. But I also think that this uh, really impacted the way that he impacted and inspired him uh, in the way that he wrote about Scotland, and and uh, because he was very um, a lot of the things that he loved about Scotland were its traditions um, and its landscapes, its old buildings, um, and it's the Catholic culture, the Christian culture, and those were things that he saw that were being uh, eroded, dying. We talked a bit about this yesterday as well. Um, about the, the dying beauty and the dying Christian culture that we have. Um, but his writings aren't bitter and they don't, they, they state the problems, but they don't focus on them. Really his, his emphasis was to, to, to just share with people and to celebrate um, the beauty that Scotland has and to encourage the, the building and the continuing of that kind of culture. Um, so. Uh, this is this quote I think really sums up what I, I think is great about him and, and his work for Scotland. <coughs> Appreciation for fine things must leave us open to much sense of deprivation during a period in which I think it may be justly alleged more is being destroyed than is being created. But we have to swallow our irascibility or it will dispel the wholesome enchantment that is no escape from reality but rather the opposite, a seeing of life whole and so finding it good. I just think that's very, just something to keep remembering and, and to be motivated by, uh, that life is good. Um, so yeah, so, 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 uh, I th just where am I? Um, another of his, his greatest works, uh, is a, uh, is a, a writing of Scotland and the Catholic faith, so a history of the Catholic Church in Scotland um, and of, of Catholic figures in Scotland. But it is more than that as well. It's a history of sanctity in Scotland and holiness in Scotland, and that includes um, post-Reformation, uh, lots of uh, holy, um, known or unknown, uh, Protestant men and women as well, and what they've done to contribute to the building of, of our culture. And um, I think that what really... Um, allowed him to do this book was his own faith and, and that's what's really beautiful to, to read about it is that you're reading it through a man who really has eyes alert to what sanctity looks like mm -hmm. so it's a, it's a history of, of saints from, from Ninian through Magnus through Columba who I got that in the wrong way <laughs> Columba Magnus uh, including St Margaret uh, and her work and then Mary Queen of Scots he includes too um, and uh, the missionary priests and new bishops, you know, right up to the present day. 
and, and he sees in this the sanctity of holy men and women as, as what they do is they, they provide an alembic distilling, giving form and purpose to human goodness, reuniting it with the divine good. Um, uh, so, uh, yeah, I think, it, I think that he probably would have agreed with you. I don't know what it means, actually. <laughs> I just realised that. <laughs> <I've worked>. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Trip to the Bahamas, if anyone yeah. knows. <laughs> um, uh, yeah, and and just for me, reading this book, you know, I've growing up in. I mean, Scottish teachers and the Scottish government and Scottish council is, is very good at promoting Scottish history, Scottish culture, music, and everything. Um, so I. I thought I knew my Scottish history, but I think reading this made me just rethink it completely mm -hmm. in that it's not a history of power and economics and mm -hmm. politics and um, all these other things. It's a history of, of martyrs and of, of people who've um, died for themselves for the faith and, and, and helped to build a civilization. So uh, I think that was good. Mm -hmm. um, yet last but not least, um, but it's, we're still on this slide though. Uh, he wrote uh, what I think is one of his greatest works. Um, it's a, a play. He wrote a lot of plays. Uh, I've actually only read this one. Uh, uh, about the last days of the life of Mary, Queen of Scots, um, uh, who he understands to be a martyr, someone who died for her faith, or at least in the face of, of great suffering, or of despair, um, persecution, just continued her life gaily and prayerfully. Um, and... Uh, and, and as an example, Christian uh, for us. Uh, and uh, it's just very beautifully written play in verse. And um, I think putting on something like that today would be such a good thing because, you know, so far our popular culture, it's, it's history, it gets its history from the films that Hollywood produces or that, you know, programs like The Tudors or there's a recent film that's come out about Mary, Queen of Scots. I haven't seen it so I don't actually know, but they do a lip service to the Catholic Church, but they don't actually take seriously what really what it means to be a Christian. And uh, so I think that something like this would help to combat that, um, but it might also just inspire people to become saints themselves. Um, that's, that, that's what the play does for me anyway. Um, so I've got my cousin and a few friends, and we're very um, inspired to try and put this play into action, so maybe in a <laughs> at some point... Um, uh, and that's something that, uh, um, yeah, that that we want to, having been inspired by George Scotland Creef and, and, and what he's got to say uh, and what he's contributed to the building of Scottish culture and, and we just, we hope to continue that work. So uh, just the, the final slide, it's just taking you back to the quote I gave you at the beginning and uh, I hope that to you've been able to see why. I think uh, this man that, that produced so much in his life, um, which reflects his devotion to faith and country, um, and that reading him, uh, knowing about him, and uh, producing the works that he produced might, might help others to, to go in love for the same. Thank you. Mm -hmm.